trying to find myself these days.
Good morning, church. The Word of God tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, anyone who is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. Behold, the old is gone and the new has come. And because Jesus, because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we can now be alive in him because he saved us. Amen. We have a new song for you this morning. It's called Goodbye Yesterday. And that's what we're singing about. So we're going to teach it to you just so you kind of get the vibe. And then we'll start it up, all right? It's real simple. It just as this. Goodbye yesterday. I'm living in the light of a new day. I won't waste another minute in my old ways. Praise the Lord. I've been born again. Goodbye yesterday. I'm living in the light of a new day. I won't waste another minute in my old ways. Praise the Lord. I've been born again. I think you got it. Let's do it. Hands up. All right, can we clap our hands?
dancing on the grave that I once lived in. Dancing on the grave that I once lived in. Dancing on the grave that I once lived in. Dancing on the grave that I once lived in. Dancing on the grave that I once lived in. Dancing on the grave that I once lived in. Dancing on the grave that I once lived in. Dancing on the grave that I once lived in. Dancing on the grave. I bought the person next to you and say, I've been born again. Amen. Good morning, church. What an amazing way to start our Sunday morning. How many of you are feeling the spirit today? We're so thankful for our worship team that helps us just prepare for an amazing morning. Just thanking Jesus for everything that he's done. I am so excited to be here to tell you about the amazing things we have going on in our church. On October 16th, we have a new on-ramp that we are trying out called the Welcome Table. We've had quite a few of these. And this is for anyone who's new to the church or maybe you've been around the church for a little bit and you just want to know more about who we are at Dustin Methodist. You'll be able to get to meet some of our pastors and our staff, and it's just a great way to connect with people who are in the same shoes as you. So we want to invite you to come hang out and have dinner with us so we can help you connect to our church. We're also super excited because our preschool, Jacob's Ladder, is having a huge fall festival this Friday night right here in this gym. We want to invite you and your families to come hang out. There will be games, face painting. They'll just have a great time. They have raffles, amazing gifts that you can win. All of the proceeds help benefit our preschool. So we would love to invite you and your families to this. The cost is $5 for both adults and children, but it is a $5 well spent. Your kids will have a blast. So come out and join us for that. Lastly, if you look at the chairs in front of you, you'll see a really cool QR code. Those are the new things, and we wanted to give you that so you can access everything going on in our church that I announce up here on stage. So if you take out your phone camera and you scan that QR code, it will take you directly to our events page on our website so you can sign up for any of the things we talk about or help join in. We are super excited to be able to offer this to you guys as our church family. Lastly, I am super excited, and I think I've said super excited 10 times, but I'm really excited that Pastor Allen and Jean are back from the GMC conference, and they were able to bring some video footage of how the conference went. So I'm going to have us play that video and invite them on stage.
you. It is good to be back. I want to say, and I can speak for Alan on this, we, we definitely appreciate your prayers. Uh, we felt those while we were in Costa Rica at this conference. Uh, your emails and your text of encouragement, we thank you for those as well. And just to, to add a little bit of, to what the video was saying, we elected six uh, kind of part-time bishops to get us into 2026. This was just a uh, general conference to basically launch the GMC officially. Our first real general conference will be held in 2026 in Central Africa. So this was just to get us started. We elected eight commissions made up of delegates from around the world to basically oversee the, the, the work of the church uh, globally. And uh, those, those six bishops and the two full-time bishops will, will help oversee that as well. So I just want to say thank you for your support. Thank you for your financial support. Uh, I can speak for Alan. I believe we both appreciate that. Every delegate paid their own expenses to uh, Costa Rica. Uh, flight, airfare, food, everything was, every delegate from around the world was responsible for their own expense. So thank you for that contribution. That meant a lot to us. And, uh, and just thank you for your support and your prayers. Yeah, and I just would want to say the three things that are significant about this is we now have a new constitution as a denomination. We have a mission that is clear and compelling. And can I just say that there was an incredible spirit of unity and power and peace. Um, one of the things that I kept praying over and over again that I prayed again this morning, is God don't stop here. Let that flow from that place to us today. And so we've been praying for you. We've been praying that God would continue to pour out his spirit upon us, that we might continue the mission of witnessing, boldly worshiping, passionately and loving extravagantly. So thank you for your support. Thank you for your prayers. And uh, we appreciate all that you did. I, I do want to just say a quick word about um, Gene. Gene uh, was elected uh, to uh, represent us on a global level um, on, uh, my mind's going blank, what commission is it, Gene? Connectional Council. The Connectional Council, which is a huge deal. So he will represent not only us as a church, but the United States uh, in a global, international way. So be praying for Gene as he gives leadership in that commission. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, brother. Love you. I want to invite you to stand and let's uh, continue to worship together this morning.
crossing eternity shore and who will you worship forever amen no one but jesus and who will be waiting when we enter in crossing eternity shore in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for bless Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want you. I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I'm just saying another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry. When I forgot that you're enough, take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to see here at your feet. Caught up in this holy moment, I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here 
Sing it, church.
So we're in a series called Mountaintop Moments, and we've been looking through the scriptures at um, times when Jesus meets certain people on mountains, and we looked uh, at how God met Abraham and called him to faithfulness and revealed his faithfulness to Abraham, and we looked at Moses and how God brought uh, the law and order um, to the to lives of people, and we looked at Elijah and how God calls his people back uh, when they're unfaithful, to be faithful to him. And this week, we're, we're looking at a different encounter. We're looking at an encounter that the people had with Jesus. Um, I want to ask you a question this morning. Anybody here want to live a life that's blessed and good? Anybody? Yeah? Is there nobody here? Yeah, there's some of us. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. We all want that, right? That's kind of a silly question. We all want a life that's blessed. We want a life that's fulfilled and, and good. Um, we use phrases like, God bless you, <laughs> all the time. Um, and we want our lives to go well. We want them to be right. In fact, most of us have a personal plan <laughs> of how we're going to live a life of blessing, don't we? Um, we've got it all laid out at some point. The plan usually involves working hard, meeting the right mate, earning as much money as we possibly can. Um, we, we want to fill our bank accounts, and we want to fill our homes with stuff, and we want to live safe, comfortable, secure lives, avoiding stress or strat- sadness or struggle. In our minds, that's what a blessed life looks like. And we seek that in earnest, quite frankly. But oftentimes, too many of us seek it in vain. I want to pose a question to you this morning. What if? What if the life that we're seeking, the life of blessing, isn't in the direction we're pursuing? What if that life that we long and desire for is in a different direction? In the passage of Scripture today, that's exactly what Jesus teaches us. Jesus gives us the secret to living a blessed life, but it is countercultural to the world we live in and to how most of us think of in pursuing a blessing. In the Gospel of Matthew, the fifth chapter, Jesus um, says these words. Listen to this, beginning with the fifth verse. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountain. And he sat down, and his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And he said these words, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they're the ones that will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice, he says, and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, They persecuted the prophets who were before you. In this passage, Jesus uses the phrase, blessed are you, eight times. Like eight times. The the word there is makarios, which means fulfillment. It, It means at peace. And Jesus, I think, in this passage is sharing with us 
what a blessed life really looks like. And if you are like me, you would agree that this is not the life that I dreamed up in my head. <laughs> That's not what a blessed life looks like at all. And yet it's exactly what Jesus teaches. Now, the first thing I want to suggest to you is that he, he's with a crowd, the Bible says, and, and you'd think he would just teach them right there, but the Bible says he begins to climb a mountain. Now, this wasn't a stroll through a meadow. If any of you have climbed a mountain before, you don't climb a mountain accidentally. You climb it with intention and discipline, right, and purpose. And, and some scholars say that Jesus did this because it gave him more of, the, of a platform to preach, right? He didn't have a headphone and, and uh, an amp and, and speakers, and so it enabled him to speak more. But, but it's interesting to me here that, that it seems as though in this text, Jesus isn't preaching to the crowds. It says the disciples went up after him, and he sat down, and he began to teach them. I want to suggest to you this morning that, that Jesus wants to teach us. But he teaches those who are willing to follow him up the mountain. A life that is blessed is not accidental. It comes from those who are willing to follow Jesus up the mountain. Those who are willing to follow Jesus against the current and the flow of a culture. Um, many of you know that I had the, the privilege to climb Mount Kilimanjaro several weeks ago. And um, one of the things that, that was a part of that was uh, that you have a guide. There were, there were six of us on our team, and there were three guides. So... And one was in the front, one was in the middle, and one was in the back. And their sole purpose the whole time we climbed Kilimanjaro was to make sure that we stayed on the trail prescribed for us to climb. There were times when that trail was pretty obvious. It was pretty easy. It was like walking down the middle of this aisle. And then there were times the trail just disappeared and piles of rocks just were there. And somehow those guys, because they had been there before, knew where to go and how to climb it. Sometimes uh, it was relatively safe, and other times there were precarious drop-offs. And uh, at those moments, we were really attuned to where the guide was headed and what he was doing, right? We had to follow where they walked. And I want to suggest to you this morning that if you want a life that's blessed, it's not a life that's random according to your plan, but it's a life that is committed to follow Jesus as your guide. In this passage, Jesus describes to us the kinds of people that will follow him. You know, before I, I climbed Kilimanjaro, uh, I tried to get in as best shape as I could, but then I went to the doctor. My wife said, you're not going without a physical right? And so I went to the doctor, got a checkup, got a physical, and the, the, the biggest thing the doctor looked at, you know, because I'm, I'm young, this surprised me, he, he was concerned about my heart. I'm teasing y'all. Um, uh, and so they did this rigorous examination of my heart. They did this 3D thing. They, they, they checked the rhythm of my heart. They checked my cholesterol. They checked my blood pressure. They checked my heart rate. All this stuff to make sure my heart was healthy enough to do what I was about to do. They wanted to make sure I could handle the climb. I want to suggest to you in this passage, Jesus gives to us a heart checkup. The, the first four of these Beatitudes really are about the heart. They're about inviting us to examine whether we have a heart that really follows Jesus. Or not. A heart that is ready to receive the blessing of God. I want to walk through some of these very quickly. Um, and so hang on. I'm going to try to move through this as fast as I can. Here's the, here's the first thing Jesus says. Those that follow him have a heart that is empty. A heart that is empty. He says it this way. Blessed 
are the poor in spirit, for they will receive the kingdom of heaven. In other words, what Jesus is saying here is, if you want to be blessed, then you have to have a heart that is poured out. A heart that is poor in spirit. The poor in spirit means that you recognize your own spiritual poverty. Your emptiness without Jesus. You recognize your inability to come to a life that is blessed without his presence. That you can't do it on your own effort. You're, you're poor in your spirit. Do you know the reason I followed those guides up the mountain? It's because I knew that there was a high probability that I would be dead if I didn't. Right? And so I listened to every word the guides said. Because I didn't want to die. And I think what Jesus is saying here, people who want to be blessed, who want to follow him, are people who understand that without Jesus, they're dead. That we don't have the capacity to bring life and blessing. That those who come to God with an empty heart receive a blessing because they are open and empty and willing. And when we do, we find his presence and his power and his peace. Here's the amazing thing. Hear this today. It is the desire of God. It is his greatest desire to fill every heart in this room with his presence and his peace and his power. It's why Jesus came. It's why he gave his life. Because God wants to fill your heart. But here's a principle I've learned. Do you know that it's very hard to fill something that's already full? Right? You can't fill something unless it's been emptied out. And the truth is, our hearts are so full of so much stuff, except for God. And the only way that we can find the fullness of God's blessing is when we're willing to empty our hearts out. I want to ask you this morning, what are you full of? Would you just turn to the person next to you and ask them, what are you full of? Right? Go ahead. Keep, come on. Go ahead. What are you full of, right? <laughs> yeah, don't answer that. I, so some of these guys down here, by the way, th th this group right here, y'all please ignore them. Um, we had our 45th high school anniversary, uh, uh, reunion last night, and they're all from the class of 79 at night school. So you, so you guys control yourselves, all right? Would you do that? Okay. Uh, it's good to have y'all here heart that is empty. It's what God blesses. It's what he fills. Here's the second thing. Jesus says that, that a heart that's broken is what God longs for. He says it this way. He says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. The mourning I think Jesus is talking about is a deep sadness um, because we realize we are broken and we live in a broken world. And we all encounter that sadness. We all encounter that brokenness through the world around us, through our own actions, through death itself. And, and Jesus says, blessed are you whose hearts are broken because cause, cause God will draw close. It's in the brokenness of our lives that God reveals his presence as he brings power as he brings grace and forgiveness, as he brings peace. Blessed are those who, who mourn over their sin and the effects that it causes because they know they need something greater than themselves. To follow Jesus means that we must have a heart 
that is broken with the things that break God's heart. The sin in our life. The pain in the world around us. I mean, does anybody in here not own the fact that we live in a broken world? All you got to do is look at the headlines yesterday. Right? But Jesus says, when our hearts break, that's when we find God's blessing. That's when he shows up. That's when he shows off the best. Here's this, the third thing he, he says in this heart checkup. He says, those that follow him not only will have a heart that's empty and a heart that's broken, but they'll have a heart that is humble. A heart that's humble. Jesus um, puts it this way. He says, blessed are those. Hold on, I lost my place. I got to go back and get it. <laughs> blessed are those who are meek they will inherit the earth. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is a heart that has been humbled. The word meekness there, it's literally the same word that they use for a racehorse. A racehorse that's powerful and strong, and yet it yields itself to the bridle. And to the one that's riding it. That's the words Jesus uses here. He says, blessed are those whose lives are humbled and yielded to God. You see, the humble are free from the need to push their own agenda. Instead, they wait on God's agenda for him to fulfill his purpose in their life. And Jesus says that they will inherit the kingdom of God. Do you know why? Because that's the same heart that Jesus had. Is it not? Do you remember in the garden where Jesus is about to face the cross and he says, Father, if if, if, if there's any way to let this cup pass for me. But then he prays, nevertheless, Lord. Father, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus taught us, he said, when you pray, pray to the Father like this. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. A life that's blessed is a life that is willing to be humbled and yielded to the will of God. But I have to confess to you this morning, there's too much of my prayer life that consists of convincing God to do my will rather than submitting my will to his. But Jesus teaches us the kingdom of God, the blessing of God belongs to those who are willing to humble their will to the Father. Can I just tell you this morning that the safest, most beautiful, most fulfilling place in all the world is smack dab in the middle of God's will for your life. But it's not always a cakewalk. I mean, just look at Jesus. (laughs) After he prayed that prayer, they crucified him. But out of the will of God comes something beautiful and wonderful. Because God honored what Jesus did by raising him from the dead. And the Bible says he sits at the right hand of God the Father. And one day he will return to judge all of the living and all of the dead. And those he says that will inherit the earth are those who have a heart like his. Here's the last thing Jesus says. He says, those that follow him are people who have a heart that is hungry. 
gets hungry. He says it this way. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. One of the things that, that happened um, as we did this hike, some people were asking me, well, what did you eat? Well, I have to confess to you that the, the people, the porters, the, the company that we used, absolutely amazing. Every day for breakfast and dinner, we had five course meals. All the food we could eat. It was unbelievable. Like they carried everything up the mountain. And when we would get to camp, the mess tent is set up, and there was food waiting on us. And it was good food. I'm talking like spaghetti and fried chicken and like french fries and cheeseburger. I mean, it was just like, wow. I mean, you know, and you just eat and eat. But the interesting thing is in the morning, like same thing, we'd, we'd have porridge and pancakes and sausage and bacon. And I know, it's was, it was, it was unbelievable. And, and, and one of the things I noticed, though, is I, we didn't have any junk food. No junk food at all whole trip and what was amazing was I would eat all that food and I would not be hungry all day long and we get to supper I'd be hungry I'd eat but I wouldn't be hungry because I wouldn't eat any junk food I got back flew flew into Atlanta first thing off the plane you know where I went yeah, everybody said McDonald's at the early service nope Chick-fil-a right man I was Dead on, number one, Chick-fil-A, boom, right? And I ate that Chick-fil-A sandwich, and I'm walking down, and I look over there, and there's a candy store, and there's a Snickers bar calling my name. Man, I grabbed that sucker, I ate that Snickers bar, and then before I could get to the gate, you know what? There was another store, and the peanut M&Ms were right there, and I grabbed those, and I ate those on the plane. And you know what I noticed about 30 minutes later? I was hungry. <laughs> I was hungry again. I've been eating all that junk food. And I thought about, you know, we're the same way spiritually. Like most of our appetites spiritually is for junk food. <laughs> the stuff of this world. The things of, of the world. Possessions, position, power, popularity. We hunger for it. We crave it. We pursue it. But all it does is leave us more and more empty. And Jesus says, those that hunger for him, those that hunger to know him more and to follow him closer and to seek him daily, those are the ones that will be blessed because they will be I want to ask you this morning, what is your heart hungry for? Jesus says those that follow him, those that want to know the blessing of God, are those that will have an empty heart, a broken heart, a hungry heart, a humble heart. How's your heart? Real quick, I want to unpack the next four. Because I think these show the actions of a heart that is blessed. Listen, listen to what he says. He says, blessed are those who are merciful. Because they're going to receive mercy. A heart that is following after Jesus shows mercy to others. Remember we talked about this several weeks ago about the definition of mercy and grace. Mercy is not getting what we deserve, and grace is getting something we don't deserve. And mercy is about not getting what we deserve, but it's also when we show mercy to others, not giving them what they need but, or, or what they deserve, but it's giving what they need. The merciful treat others better than they deserve. They care for the hurting and the vulnerable, and they seek to show compassion whenever possible. I, I love Mike, Micah 6. It's, it's one of my life verses that says this. It says, He has shown you, O man, what is required of you, what is good. The word is blessed there, the same word. What is good and blessed, right? 
to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Here's another, another thing. Uh, uh, the actions of a heart that are right with God, excuse me, <clears throat> is they will seek God. They'll seek God. Jesus says it this way. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The literal word there, pure, means this. It means an undivided heart. Those who seek God with, with all that they are, those who put God first, allowing God's will to be done in their life. And, and, and Jesus says this, when, when we seek God that way, we will, we will find him. We will see him. And that's what he says later. And Matthew says, knock and the door will be opened. Seek and you will find. When we make a habit to seek after Jesus every day, he tells us we will find him. We'll find him. Any of you remember the, the books, Where's Waldo books? Anybody? Yeah, uh, my, my oldest son now, he's 30, but when he was young, I, we loved those big Waldo, Where's Waldo books. We'd sit there for hours looking for Waldo. And you know, you know what was amazing is that Waldo was on every single page, but you just didn't find Waldo accidentally. <laughs> you had to look for him. I mean, you had to really look for him to find him. I want you to hear today that Jesus is on every page of every day of your life. He's standing there just waiting to reveal his presence and his blessing. But we have to look for him. We have to invite him into our day. Be aware of his, his leading, his presence, his voice and the people we encounter, and the things that are happening around us. But Jesus says, when we do that, we will find him. We'll see him. Here, here's the next thing. i gotta keep, I got to push, because I don't want y'all to have to eat lunch in here this morning. Um, so here's the next one. Is, is there a heart that is yielded to God, a heart that is seeking Jesus? will secure peace with others. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called the children of God. Okay? Those are not throwaway words, folks. I really wish they weren't in there sometime, especially when my wife and I are disagreeing, right? Sometimes when you guys want to talk to me, I, I'd rather make war than peace. But Jesus says, if you want the blessing of God, you will seek to be people of peace. Now, here's the thing. I'm not talking about people who just sweep the stuff under the rug, right? And, and I'm not talking about people who just let themselves be doormats to be run over. That's not what we're talking about. What I'm talking about is being willing to do the hard work with other people, lovingly and caroling, work through your differences by building bridges rather than building walls when you disagree. Listen to what Jesus says just a few verses later in Matthew 5. He says, When you offer your gift to God at the altar and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave that place. Leave it at the altar. In other words, what Jesus is saying here is you being at peace with those around you is more important than you sitting in church and worship. He says, if God brings to you somebody in mind that you're at odds with, you need to get up out of worship and you need to go find them. Now, don't leave right now, I pray, okay? Hang in there. But he says it's that important to be at peace as much as we are able. He says, go and make peace with that person and then come back and bring your gift. And then last but not least, I, I'd like to just run out of time and leave this one, but I can't. 
it's, it's the hardest one of the, of, of the room. And <laughs> he says, those who follow Jesus will suffer persecution. He says, blessed are those that are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Can I just say to you this morning that what Jesus teaches us goes against what our culture teaches. And when you begin to follow Jesus, do not expect the world to stand up and applaud you. We, we um, have lived in a nation for the last 40 years that kind of had a Christian culture. So, but, but I'm just telling you in the days ahead, what I perceive as a counterculture in which we who follow Jesus must just go ahead and get this nailed down. Folks aren't going to rise up and call you blessed. But Jesus will. Jesus will. He goes on to say this, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely accuse you of all kinds of evil. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. You know, I don't understand why God allows the difficulties of this life. I mean, you know, there's a theological thing, but honestly, when we face death or loss or persecution or difficulties, like we don't want a theological thing, we... we it's an emotional thing, right? And we hurt. And we wonder, where are you, God, and why, God? But, but God promises us that, that he's at work, even in those things. And sometimes God allows those things into our life to, to reveal what's on the inside of our life. And you know, the truth is, when you squeeze an orange, it reveals what's on the inside, doesn't it? When you squeeze a, ta- a, a tube of toothpaste, it reveals what's on the inside. And sometimes... God allows the things of life to squeeze us to help us see what's on the inside. James says this, he says, Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you face trials, because the testing of your faith will produce perseverance, and the perseverance will finish the work that God started in you to bring you to maturity and completeness. Joy is the outward indication of an inward heart that is right with God even in the difficulties of life. That's why Jesus could say rejoice and be glad. So I want to ask you real quick, wrapping it up here, how's your heart? How's the checkup this morning? If you're with me, this message, to be honest, after I read it, I can't preach that. Everybody would be discouraged and leave and quit and not come back to church anymore. Right? It's kind of discouraging if we get honest. If you're like me, you might be saying, this would be harder than climbing Mount Everest to do all this. In fact, we're not even really to the hard parts because if you go past that scripture later on in Matthew, he talks things about like, don't be angry, don't lust, you know, uh, he talks about marriage. He talks about loving your enemy. It's like, man, I'm like, oh, I'm such a worm. The standards that Jesus is laying out are too high for us to imagine, much less attain. But here's the deal. In and of ourselves, It is impossible, it's impossible to have the right attitudes and the right heart and the right actions. Jesus is saying these things not to tell us what we want to hear, but tell us what we need to hear. And this is not something we do on our own. It is only something that Jesus can do in us when we submit our lives and our hearts to him in the fullness of his presence. The last night of the summit, we got up at midnight and we started hiking in the dark. Six and a half hours to the summit. 
the wind was blowing about 30 miles an hour. It was minus 20 degrees, and it was pitch black dark. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And, and remember the three guides that I was telling you about? That night, they added three more guides. And those three guides, you know what they did the whole way up the mountain? They danced and they sang around us. And can I just tell you, the first 30 minutes, I was absolutely irritated and mad at them. Because I was just trying to take the next step. And they're, oh, 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 you know, I'm like, would you shut up and just let me, you know. They would come up behind you, this one guy would come up behind you, roar like a lion, and I'm like, please leave me alone. But after about 30, 40 minutes of that, I got over the initial shock of it. I realized what they were doing. They were dancing over us. They were encouraging us. They were helping us up the mountain. In fact, there were times when one of us would get tired and they would take the pack off of that person and they would carry it as their own. There was one time where, where one of our, our, our uh, folks just could not take another step and they two of them came alongside her and put their arms under her arms and they literally like picked her up and walked her up the mountain. They were there to help us. You know, Jesus, when he left this earth, he said, I have to leave this earth, I have to leave my physical body because the Father is going to send the Spirit, the Helper, the Encourager, the one that will walk alongside you, that will pick you up, that will carry you when you can't take another step, the one that will carry your burden for you if you will let him. And the good news of, of this today is that what Jesus calls us to here is not something that we are expected to do on our own, but it is what his spirit does in us as we live out his presence and we yield our lives to him. And when we do that, Jesus says, our life will be. Blessed. True blessing starts when we follow him. It's why Jesus would say in this chapter before this, repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. If you want the blessings of the kingdom, you must be willing to turn your heart toward the king. To open yourself to his leading, to his guiding. How about you? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you today. I thank you for your word that leads and guides like a light on our path. But Jesus, I thank you even more for your Holy Spirit that helps us to live out your word. Lord, we thank you for your spirit that sings over us and walks with us and lives in us and encourages us. And Lord, we just come to you today and we confess that too often um, we, we, uh, we claim you as Lord, but our hearts are far from what you taught. And so, Lord, all we can do today is offer you ourselves, our hearts, our lives. Come, Jesus, do in us that which we cannot do for ourselves. Deliver us, free us, forgive us, fill us, that we might live a life of blessing. And it's in your name we ask it, Jesus. And all of God's people said it. We're going to stand together and sing our closing hymn. And as we do, I just want to remind you that the altars are here for you to come and pray and to be with God. Marissa's going to be over at this cross. I'll be over there. If there's anything that we can pray with you about, particularly that we want to be there to do that with you. Would you stand together and let's sing.
Just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sing another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm sorry when I've come. I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where we started.
So listen, today, before we get out of here, I, I do want to do one thing. Um, are you grateful for Andy Cottrell? We, we are so blessed by Andy and his leadership every week. And uh, Andy is going to be on a three-week tour with a band called War of Ages. Um, if, if you're not tatted up and pierced up, you probably don't want to go listen to the music. I'm just going to tell you. But... Uh, but it is uh, of God, and uh, I, I want you to be praying for Andy as he travels with, uh, with this band, and, and they minister to people who are far from God. And uh, today, as we close, I want to invite you just to extend a hand to Andy. And let's pray a prayer blessing over him today. Would you do that? Lord God, we thank you so much for Andy and Kavina and their family, Lord, for your call upon his life for the gifts that you've given him and for the heart he has to worship you. And we pray, Lord, today that as he uh, does this tour that you would go with him, protect him, be with Kavina and their family and watch over them. And uh, Lord, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do in and through them and the way that your kingdom is going to advance and your light will shine in the darkness because of this. And so we give you thanks for him and we bless him in your name. Go now, may the peace of God go with you.